presentation. Uh, I'm glad to see everyone is showing up. Uh, very few presentations I've been to now that were in person. So this is, I like that we're looking in as smaller Zoom boxes. Now this is a larger room. Uh, that's excellent. And so be before we have the presentation, uh, I'm going to give you a little background on Olympic Climate Action. It's a group of uh, volunteers that are very concerned about climate change, both locally, statewide, nationwide, and of course worldwide. Uh, we have over 800 people on our distribution list. And if you're not uh, on our distribution list, we have sign-up sheets over here tonight. You can please sign up to get on our distribution list. It's our membership is open to everybody that is concerned about climate change which I hopefully everyone here tonight is concerned about climate change. So please uh, put your name on this. Uh, before we start the presentation this evening, um, to, uh, I, I'm being my introductory remarks, I want to remind you that at the conclusion of Dr. Miller's presentation, we, we're going to have a short business meeting in the back of the room. Uh, you, you can leave if you don't want to be part of the business meeting, but we're going to be looking at uh, nominations and voting on new members to our board of directors for the Olympic Climate Action and some uh, and some um, very minor changes to our bylaws but so please stick around if you would, would like to um, and I have to look at my notes because I don't remember everything I'm supposed to say here uh, again Olympic Climate Action is uh, we I, I say we do it both locally and uh, nationally and, and uh, statewide um, we, we, if you haven't already, you can always Google our website, Limit Climate Action, and we have a very uh, uh, active, hot off the wire uh, uh, sheet that uh, describes uh, various actions that are going on uh, uh, around the, the whole region. Um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Janice Berger, who's also on our board of directors, and she will be introducing the speaker. Cool. Thanks, Ed. And um, quick announcement, we, we only have one flyer because we're not distributing it yet, but we have a, another program in the future. Um, so keep Mark December 1st on your calendar for Alaska Sweet, which is, uh, here, I'm going to read because I can't describe And when you say you want to post one, there yeah, is you can post it. Take one, but um, can, it's an amazing kind of multimedia uh, jazz musicians from Seattle who volunteer their time and, uh, with with me with images of Alaska and uh, about climate change and, and a sort of discussion story. And music. That's in early December, going to be in Port Townsend, Squim, and, and here in Port Angeles. So please come. But tonight, uh, Dr. Ian Miller, I'm, I'm no, he from when he used to work out at Nature Grid, but he's been on the peninsula for what do we decide, 26 years. And uh, I was thinking, what are some cool anecdotes about why you're interested in the sea? And he said he's the son of a Navy man, so there we, there we go. But he's been studying um, sea level rise with Washington Sea Command for a long time, and it's been really, really nice having his expertise here and his willingness to, to, to share that expertise with all of us. So thank you so much for, for being here tonight. So first of all, um, I'm going to turn this mic on, which hopefully works. I should say we'll yeah, figure it out. Yeah, there's a button, a big button. Okay. Does that do anything? Yeah. Can everyone hear me? Yes. In the back? All right. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, again, Ian Miller with Washington Sea Grant. Uh, you're here hopefully to hear about sea level rise. That's my intent. Um, and. Uh, the reason that I'm here is because I have in this role that I have with Sea Grant. Um, which I'll describe in just a second. I focused over the last five or ten years on sea level rise, mostly oriented towards uh, management in Washington State. So that's kind of my interest is in uh, understanding the implications of sea level rise here in Washington State in our coastal communities. Uh, so the plan for tonight is uh, I want everyone to walk away with a sense of what do we mean when we use this word sea level rise. I'm guessing many of you have that in mind just in case. And then, is it already happening in Washington State? Why is it happening, and what does the future hold? So that's the plan. Uh, before we start, so uh, many of you may not have heard of Sea Grant. Um, we are a University of Washington-based program. We are an extension program, so our sort of 
Heritage is in the land grant program, but we're configured differently. We focus on marine and coastal issues, and we, uh, we don't have county offices like WSU does, but we do have field staff like myself. I live and work here in Port Angeles, uh, operating out of Peninsula College. And mostly what we try to do is create connections between uh, coastal communities in our case, and science or other resources that can help manage the various coastal issues. Uh, I work in coastal hazards, but many of my colleagues work in areas like fisheries, aquaculture, water quality, uh, boat safety, all sorts of different things related to the challenges of living in coastal communities. One of those challenges is coastal flooding, and so this is kind of where we launch into the sea level rise theme. Uh, some of you may, um, may know what you're looking at here. This is uh, December 27th, 2022, a couple months ago, when a uh, extreme coastal water level event uh, impacted especially much of Puget Sound, less so out here, it wasn't as notable out here, but in Puget Sound, definitely a notable flooding event. Uh, a few things made it notable. One, it was widespread. So here's a couple more flooding photographs, one from down in South Sound, one from up in North Sound. So this is a widespread event. It was also unprecedented, and it set water level records at five tide gauges in Puget Sound. Those are the ones shown with the red arrows, including in Seattle. And that's notable because Seattle has, by far, the longest water level record, coastal water level record that we have in Washington that dates back about 120 years. So this event set a record. <clears throat> and like most of our uh, flooding events, sort of on the face of it, this event was made up, was driven by two things. It was driven by the alignment of a high tide with a storm. So to try to illustrate that, I always revert to data. It's uh, yeah, both a blessing and a curse. I know that you probably can't see that there, but what you're looking at are uh, predicted water levels for six tide gauges in Washington State. These are Port Angeles, Cherry Point, Friday Harbor, Port Townsend, Bremerton, and Tacoma. Doesn't matter that you can see them. The key thing is to note there we have that low tide and then that high tide following it. And then those tide gauges also typically measure weather data. So what I'm showing you now is pressure recorded at those tide gauges. This is uh, uh, air pressure. And you can see that you can see the passage of that storm in the pressure uh, information there. And the final thing that I'm going to show you here is what we call the non-tidal residual. This is the storm surge associated with that pressure. When we sort of lower atmospheric pressure, typically during large storms, the sea surface kind of rebounds a bit, if you will. So we tend to get higher than predicted water level during those events. So this was a classic sort of coastal flooding event for our area in the sense that we had almost perfect alignment between the low pressure, that peak in storm surge, and the high tide. They all co-occurred. We get super elevation of the water. We get flooding as a consequence. So one way to think about this, the way, the way that I tend to think about it, is that we go into every winter sort of rolling the dice. Every storm is a roll of the dice. It's a roll of the tide dice and a roll of the storm surge dice. When those align is when we get our extreme events. Um, so in that way, it was kind of a standard kind of storm event, but the theme of the talk is sea level rise, and indeed, as I'll show you, uh, sea level rise is weighting the dice in favor of making these kinds of events more frequent and more extreme. So before we go on, what is sea level rise? So I know many of you probably can't see this, but you may have seen it online before. This is a plot drawn from the NOAA Tides and Currents website. This is NOAA's site where they collect and serve data um, collected at the tide gauges. We have eight of them in Washington State. And this is monthly average water level from Nia Bay dating back to uh, when that station was founded in 1936, I think, if I recall correctly. So tide gauge been sitting there collecting water level every six minutes since 1936, and then those get averaged into a monthly value. And that's what you're seeing here. And I'm sorry, that's not Nia Bay. That's Seattle. Yeah. <laughs> Many of you are like, what are you talking about? So this is Seattle. And you don't have to look at the numbers or anything like that. The key thing to note there is the upward trend in uh, this data set. 
This is what we refer to as sea level rise. It's the long-term change in sort of an annual or decadal average in that water level. So um, the, the reason that I think it's important to think about kind of this definition in light of where we live is that you have to think about all the processes occurring on top of this increasing average, our tidal cycle, our storm surge patterns, to really start to understand why, say, six inches or a foot of sea level rise has consequences in an environment like ours where the water level varies by 12, 13, or 14 feet a day. It's kind of a hard thing to wrap your brain around. It's at least a hard thing for me to wrap my brain around, but indeed it is the case. Um, the other question we can ask as an extension here is, is sea level rise happening in Washington State? And this is kind of a complicated question, um, as it turns out. Uh, it should be obvious from that Seattle example that I showed you that it is, but we don't have to go very far, only out to Nia Bay, so this is where Nia Bay finally comes in, um, to see that the tide gauge there records the opposite pattern. Sea level is falling in Nia Bay as measured by the tide gauge. And so with this in mind, it's kind of hard to understand exactly what the ocean is doing. So one of the things that I have focused on, interestingly enough, over the last couple of years is really trying to understand what the land is doing. So we dove into this in detail a couple of years ago because it's important to understand how the land is moving in order to understand what the tide gauges are telling us about the ocean, as well as to understand what the implications are of sea level rise for communities around the state that have very different patterns of what we call vertical land movement. So what you see up on the screen, hopefully, is a map of Western Washington with a bunch of colored symbols on it that represent places that we can actually measure uh, vertical land movement. This is how fast the land is rising up or down and in this case, the hot colors are places that, are, uh, we, that we think are moving up. Cool colors are places that we think are moving down. These estimates come from tide gauges. They come from GPS stations that are fixed on the landscape. They come from highway side survey markers in some cases. They can all be put together to develop a sense for what the pattern is on the landscape. And one thing that hopefully pops out at you here is that there's a lot of variability, right? We live in a sort of tortured landscape the signatures of uh, our subduction zone are all over these data. Um, and uh, the other thing to note here is these rates are kind of small. They're measured in millimeters per year, roughly how fast your fingernails grow in some cases. Uh, however, over years and decades again, they start, they accumulate and they matter in terms of understanding sea level change. And the key thing is, going back to sort of our original question, is if we remove the vertical land movement estimate that we have now for every tide gauge in Washington, this is what we see. So what you're looking at now is time on the lower axis. So this goes roughly a little before 1940 out to 2020. And this is change in feet relative to uh, 1990 to 2010, just an arbitrary zero. And uh, these are in uh, fractions of feet. The thin line is the annual average. And again, this removes this, the influence of land movement. This is just what the ocean is doing. And then the dark black line is a rolling 20-year average. Again, just looking for that long-term average. And hopefully what pops out at you there is that we do have an upward trend in sea level in Washington State. It amounts to about four inches over this record, so not very much. Um, however, I will show you that it does have impacts. Um, and. Um, and also that we expect that, that trend to continue. So what are the impacts of that sea level rise? Well, the most obvious and visible one is that um, we expect coastal flooding to increase in frequency and magnitude, right? This is the obvious signature of uh, sea level rise on the landscape. Showed you this photograph before from that event in Port Townsend in December of last year. What's interesting about, um, about this particular event, at least to me, is that this is the first event that I think we've been able to actually calculate how that small amount of observed sea level rise that we have in Washington, four inches over the last 60, 70 years, not much at all, um, has changed the likelihood 
of this event occurring. So again, this kind of record-breaking event. If we had not experienced sea level rise in our area, this event would have had a very fractional, I don't know if you can see that number, 0.125% annual chance of occurrence. That equates to something you'd expect on average once every 800 years. Whereas with sea level rise, this now has an annual chance of occurring of about 1%, something we'd expect on average every 100 years. Right? So this is kind of the impact of sea level rise in terms of changing the frequency of events like this. Sea level rise also has other less visible and obvious impacts. Uh, this particular uh, photograph is from the Chesapeake Bay during a fishing trip I was on with my dad. And um, what I was trying to take a photograph of, if you can see there, is this ghost, what they call ghost forest there. Here, we refer to ghost forests as being associated with tsunamis. In the Chesapeake Bay, it's associated with uh, forests attempting to retreat uh, up elevation in association what is there, a much more rapid rate of sea level rise than we are currently experiencing. But these kinds of habitat responses to sea level rise are expected, they're observed uh, in other places around the world, and we do expect that we will see them emerge here as well. So what's the driver? Um, this is a climate-related uh, sort of process, and really associated, and by the way, I am not going to dive into the conceptual model of climate change. I'm making an assumption that everyone has a sense for uh, sort of the driver of climate change. Um, and in particular, that the response is that an accumulation of a heat energy in the Earth's system. There's two processes that drive sea level rise that respond to that. They're both processes that everyone has probably, intera probably interacted with today. And that's why I visualized them this way on the screen. One is that if we expose ice to this heat energy, uh, it tends to have a harder time staying uh, in state as ice and tends to, over time, transfer into its liquid form water and then flow into the ocean. The second is that as you warm water, it expands. Um, can we get some lights? Because I brought demos, right? Got to do some demos. Got to have some colored water. So these are both, again, easy things to model and visualize. These are examples from your own home, obviously. But just in case, um, I brought some sort of examples to try to model both of these things. This is kind of a thermal expansion demonstration, and I've added some heat energy to it. I don't do this one very much, so I have no idea how long it'll take. Um, but I've got this little green thing that marks our sea level, and we'll just see how that responds to this additional heat building up in this fluid. Now this is just like a mercury thermometer, for those of you that remember those, but you may not be aware that water has this same property, and it occurs in the oceans. The other big process, is melting of land-based ice. So we're talking here not about sea ice, ice that freezes from the ocean, since that already displaces water. So when it melts, it doesn't contribute to sea level rise. We're talking about masses of ice that are perched on land, so that when they melt or lose mass through time, that's just an addition of new volume into the ocean basin. So kind of the easy way to demo that, or to model that, hopefully without a big mess, is that in this case, I'm going to make a land ice system. So I've got my ice perched up on land right here. And in this one, I'm going to add my ice into the ocean. And then in both cases, I'm just going to mark sea level. Is that right? Pretty close. OK, and we'll just see how those respond over the course of the next 10 or 15 minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so in an effort to try to sort of explore both of these processes, uh, I'm going to use this visualization. This is what's called a sea level budget. This work was done by the European Space Agency, but it's, fun dip it. it's been done by a lot of groups. I just chose theirs because they had a nice white plot that I could draw on. And so what you're looking at here, we've got time. I know you can't see that in the back. This is 1994 to 2017. So this is kind of recent observational period. And then this is kind of a change, a relative change in sea level. This is in millimeters, but I'm going to, tra I'm going to transfer everything to inches. So the curve that you see on there is uh, observed global average sea level. This is actually 
uh, uh, measured from space using what's called radar altimetry. So this is a satellite system that can measure very accurately changes in the Earth's surface using radar. And they uh, are sort of continually making measurements of the ocean and developing these estimates for the mean height of the ocean surface and then how it changes through time. So this is a measurement, direct measurement of sea level rise. So that's what you're seeing there. It equates to about three inches since 1994. So a little bit of a faster rate globally than we observe locally. That's an interesting thing that we'll set aside. And if anyone wants to nerd out on that afterwards, I'd be happy to do so. Um, so the first thing we're gonna look at is this idea of thermal expansion. We warm water up and it expands. The consequence in the ocean basin, which we can view as being fixed, is the height increases as we warm it up. Um, the warming here is minuscule. We're talking about fractions of a degree potentially, but because of the volume of the ocean, it can manifest as a measurable change of the surface. So how is this actually measured? Um, since the early 2000s, it's been measured with what are called Argos floats. So the, the uh, yellow device up in the corner is one of these floats. These are autonomous thermometers, basically, that are uh, floating around the ocean. All these green dots represent one of these things. There are hundreds, if not thousands of them uh, deployed. They um, are designed to sort of autonomously sink into the ocean measuring temperature as they go and then come back to the surface, transmit their data and their location, um, and then do it again. And they do it as, until they get destroyed or they wash up on a beach or whatever. Um, and so from this data set, we can add the component of this budget that is associated with that thermal expansion. And so that's what's illustrated here. These measurements have been made since early 2000. This bit before here is kind of like a modeled estimate um, derived from that. And in total, that contributes about an inch since 1994. So about a third of the observed. And then land-based ice we can also observe. So what you're seeing here is an animation published by NASA. This is another space-derived measurement, in this case, of gravity. So this is derived from the GRACE satellite mission launched in the early 2000s. This is a set of satellites that are uh, circling the Earth, and based on how far apart from, the, from, the, from each other they are, very clever people can estimate how the mass of the Earth's surface is changing. And so over time, you can develop this record, this uh, actual measurement, of changes in mass of places like Greenland. And so that's what you're seeing expressed here. Uh, the, uh, there's also estimates that can be derived for Antarctica, which is another big contributor, as well as mountain glaciers. And um, you saw the animation play, play out there, but Greenland probably doesn't come as a surprise to any of you, is losing mass currently, as is Antarctica and as are mountain glaciers. So all of those contributions together can get added to the budget here. So that's what I've done here two inches since 1994, um, uh, associated with that addition of new volume to the Earth's surface. With also a very interesting, um, some of you may <coughs> have noted, some of you may have, I thought, oh no, there's a laser, I'll just point awkwardly. Some of you may have noted this acceleration, uh, sort of in this recent time period, that you can see is associated with these land-based ice dynamics making increasing contributions to the ocean basins. And the other thing is that that red line up at the top is the sum of these two, right? And so we can use that as a way to say the budget is mostly closed. There's little gaps and wiggles in there, but for the most part, these two components explain the observed pattern over this historic period. These are the two main drivers, and both of these are climate sensitive. So that begs the question, how much more sea level rise can we expect? And there's really kind of two fundamental answers to this question. Uh, one is that it depends partly on how warm we make it. Uh, some of you are likely familiar with something that looks like this. These are temperature projections that are associated with a set of what are called emissions scenarios. These are storylines that are crafted to sort of describe plausible future scenarios of emissions 
um, of long-lived greenhouse gases um, that are then shared around the world and basically anyone who's modeling climate change will typically use those and that way they can compare their work to sort of the next person over or the person in the next country and sort of get a sense for what that looks like and how their models compare. Um, and of course, uh, if we as a global species basically are able to figure out emissions that track in this kind of look that sort of align with these lower scenarios the expectation is we have a lower global average temperature associated with that and because those two sea level processes are directly associated with those temperatures we expect less sea level rise by contrast if i go the other way if we follow the upper emission scenario the reverse is true we expect more sea level rise more rapidly to occur in response to this but there's also a large degree of uncertainty associated with uncertain processes. I know no one can read this probably in detail, but I decided to throw this up here to illustrate this because this was today's hot media topic. I think uh, three people uh, in the lead up to the talk brought this up with me. And this is a paper that was published, interestingly enough, last year. This is a paper, one of many that are coming out associated in particular with trying to understand uncertainty in Antarctica in particular. So Antarctica, for a whole variety of reasons, is a big potential contributor to sea level rise. Uh, it is by far the largest mass of land-based ice on the globe. Um, and it is also by far the hardest one to understand. It is very big, it's very complicated, and it's a hard place to work. And so as a result, it's just a hard place to, to understand. As a result, a lot of papers use modeling to sort of try to get around this problem, use computer models to try to understand uh, what is happening in Antarctica. This is a modeling paper. This one is about um, how, what, what are the possible historic trends in ocean temperature around Antarctica? And the question they're trying to get at here ultimately is can we explain why we have observed mass loss in Antarctica over the last 20 years. So those gray satellites that I showed you the animation from from Greenland also show mass loss in Antarctica. The weird thing about that is that unlike Greenland, Antarctica still is below freezing most of the time. And so there's other explanations beyond just sort of warming that need to be invoked to try to explain what's happening in Antarctica. So, I bring this up to note that this highlights that work is happening to try to explain what we observe now in Antarctica. And so once you start thinking about what to expect in the future, it becomes, you know, the uncertainties only grow from there. It's a difficult place to work. The other reason that I chose this paper to highlight is, I like the sweaters, no I'm joking. Um, is that the media reporting associated with it drew my attention immediately. This was the headline associated with that paper, Humans Have Lost Control of the West Antarctic Ice Sheet, and it could cause global sea levels to rise by 3.2 feet by 2100. Um, the, the few things that caught my eye here, just to note, is the paper was not about sea level rise. <laughs> and so that was kind of one thing. But digging into this media reporting, the other thing that I noted in this paper was a f they, they found a few people to provide quotes along the lines of, um, you know, we, when you see a projection from, say, the IPCC, which is the international sort of body that does sort of global projections, you should just double those numbers because they're just getting it wrong. And I think the thing, the, sort of partly to be provocative, but partly because this is swirling in my head, I want to spend the last few minutes making a few points to sort of suggest maybe that's not the case and, and also that that doesn't change anything about what, you know, the, the planning that we should be doing, I think, um, as communities, coastal communities associated with sea level rise. So a couple of points. Number one, what you're looking at here is projections for Washington State. These were projections that I was part of putting together, published in 2018. They are what we call probabilistic. And so you got time down here, change in sea level and feet over here, <coughs> the usual sort of routine. 
And then you got a bunch of lines over here that are associated with different percentages. The idea behind this is to show the range of uncertainty in possible future sea level for Washington State. And you know, the idea is that up in the top part of the curve, you've got these numbers like four, five, six, seven feet that are shown as being low likelihood but can't be excluded as possibilities, right? And that's important to consider. They can't be excluded. However, we also have this likely range, which is shown in the gray bar. It's kind of in this two to three foot range by the end of the century. And the thing that struck me about that was that that kind of two to three feet by the end of the century, even though there's a lot of sort of talk about how much models have changed, and especially when it comes to sea level rise, there's so much uncertainty, that has been a very consistent assessment number for a long time, multiple decades. So I've got two examples there from the IPCC from 2014 and 19, in which their median estimates fall right in that range, two to three feet by 2100. The second thing to note is that we can also increasingly use what we observe uh, as a way to assess uh, where we are tracking relative to projections. So that's what I've done here. I've taken those observations I showed you earlier in black, and the red are the probabilistic projections I just showed you. Um, these are for RCP 8.5, and the thing to pay attention to is the dark black line sort of tracking in that, in that um, what we call the likely range, sort of in there, right? So again, the observations currently track in that intermediate range. The third point um, is that kind of when these papers come out about models or we make observations or we sort of see media reports about uh, you know, things happening in certain parts of the world, we have this expectation that they don't align with models, but it's worth pointing out that if we go back to our observed sea level and we extrapolate the last 10 years out to 2100, we get to about 12 inches of sea level rise by 2100. That's just extrapolating our observations. Whereas the projections of the components, so we've got our uh, thermal expansion component and our ice vault here in our land ice addition of water melting component. You can see the projections over there for, these are the median projections from the most recent IPCC report, AR6, came out last year, 2022. 11 inches from this component, 14 inches from this component. And the point here is that both of these we expect to accelerate in the coming years and decades um, by two to three times to be able to reach just that two to three foot intermediate territory. So in other words, there will be very obvious signals from the landscape. Um, things that we have not yet observed will happen in Greenland and Antarctica in particular, I think, that we'll read about, and there'll be this impulse to sort of say, we did not expect this. But in fact, this is exactly what these models are suggesting should be happening. Um, it's kind of sad to have a hypothesis supported like this, but this is what we expect to see occurring, to reach even that two to three foot range by 2100. And then the final point I'll make is that um, it's obviously right to get, it's obviously uh, good to get your planning scenario right, right? If we do expect, say, six feet of, of sea level rise by 2100, it's important to get that right. But it's worth noting that we have plenty to think about as communities with just two to three feet. Um, so, in terms of embarking on planning, trying to figure out where our vulnerabilities are, this is a great place to start. And to highlight that, I'm gonna use a just published assessment. This is from Jefferson County. This was released a few months ago, in which they mapped uh, various assets in Jefferson County, buildings, septic systems, wells, um, and compared them to sea level rise scenarios. And they found for their plus two foot sea level rise scenario, so adding two feet, that the number of home or buildings in that at-risk zone increases by almost three, and the number of wells almost doubles in association with that. So this is plenty to do to sort of try to think about these vulnerabilities even absent of those more extreme scenarios. And so, just by way of ending, thank you 
Um, I'm excited to hear if there's any questions or discussion. Uh, I have my contact information down at the bottom, so if we don't get to anything, that's how you get in touch with me. Um, and I also just wanted to end, one of the things, I do a lot of this kind of stuff, and uh, there's always a bit of like a downer thing to it, right? Um, I have like a little bit of a Dr. Doom reputation, and so I like to end on a high note. <laughs> so this is my effort to end on a high note. I just want to point out, I do a lot of work with other colleagues around the country from other states who are engaged in the same kind of thing, trying to figure out how do we go about uh, sort of planning for this particular stressor for coastal communities. One thing I hear frequently is that Washington State is viewed as a leader in this realm. And I think that there's um, some evidence to support this. I just threw these up. This is, again, that Jefferson County assessment. This just came out. Port Angeles Climate Resiliency Plan just came out. Communities are starting in on this, and I know that uh, there's many who feel they should be doing less. There's many who feel they should be doing more. But um, you know, I, in my mind, I always view it as a positive if it's just being tackled as an issue. So to me, that's the positive, and um, excited to hear everyone's responses. Thank you. Thank you. Do I just go for it? Questions? Yeah. yeah. Okay. We've, yeah. Got, we've got like 20 minutes for questions. In, um, early on in the presentation, you had a graph of the sort of net <clears throat> aggregate sea level rise in Seattle yeah. versus the net aggregate sea level life rise in Dia Bay. Yeah. If you had one of those for Port Angeles, yes. would it be pretty level? So um, the uh, Port Angeles tide, we do have a tide gauge in Port Angeles, so we have that record. The bummer is that it only, it was installed in the 70s, and so we don't have anywhere near the length of record that, uh, see, I forgot to totally mention, Seattle dates to 1898, uh, Nia Bay to 1936, I think, uh, Friday Harbor is 1936, most of the other tide gauges are newer than that. And so um, we don't, the, the record's not long enough to really uh, establish a trend without some statistical trickery. Um, so if you go onto the NOAA website and look at the trend they have, it's essentially no different from zero, dating back to the 70s. And I think that, you know, like Port Angeles is interesting because, um, if I go back, oh, sorry about this, I could do a seizure. Um, if I go back here, this is one of the things I think that's so cool about the strait, is that it, it's like a seesaw, right? And so uplift happening out here in Nia Bay, subsidence happening in Port Townsend, and somewhere in the middle is an inflection point, a zero point. And I don't know where that point is. Um, I, just, I, I look at your maps on the wall at Faro every yeah. Saturday yeah. and tell people where not to buy property. Yep. And <laughs> it strikes me that Dungeon S is just a whole lot worse than Port Angeles. You yes. can hardly find any place that's, gonna, that's likely to be underwater yes. by 2050 yes. in Port Angeles. And that's not because of vertical land movement, that's because it's much steeper, right? Um, so, you know, one of the things that characterizes our landscape, for the most part, is that it's relatively steep. Um, and so there's not a lot of places that are extraordinarily vulnerable, especially when you look at them in map view like that, right? Where you're sort of looking, your eyes drawn to those big blue blobs that tend to occur in places that are low-lying and flat. So the Dungeness River Delta is the, uh, you know, is our good local example of a place that's low-lying and flat, likely a lot of exposure there. Um, whereas Port Angeles is higher um, and steeper. And so you just don't have that kind of exposure. Now, I've changed my spiel. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, one thing, so I recently, we're in the middle of a project in which we're trying to map sea level rise vulnerability onto parcels in Puget Sound. Um, and we haven't extended it out to the street yet because we don't have good elevation data. We do now, but we have to sort of do the analysis. And, um, one of the things we found from that, so we gave every parcel a score, and we found 3,000 parcels out of a total of 111,000 that fell into that highest vulnerability category. And 
So very relatively few, something like 2.8% of the total that fell into this high vulnerability category. And the reason, one of the reasons is that we live in a steep landscape. And so we have a fundamentally different, I think, opportunity than many regions of the country, right? Notably Florida and parts of the Central East Coast that are you know, much flatter, much low, more low line. Like my takeaway from that process was that if we sort of can focus attention somehow on a fairly small amount of parcels, we gain a lot of vulnerability benefit. Now, let me point out though that when you look at things in map view, it doesn't always reflect your real vulnerabilities. So what the city of Seattle, for example, has found is that they really had to think about things like stormwater outfalls and other drainage systems relative, even though it's sort of a similarly steep landscape and there's not a lot of low-lying vulnerability there, they have these other vulnerabilities they identified um, that they are adjusting. Um, so that's worth pointing out. That was a long-winded answer, I'm sorry. I like long-winded. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned, um, I think when we were talking about this, about ideas, well, first off, maybe identifying the, the worst case for the, the most vulnerable places, and then ideas of what what are some solutions. I know that things like uh, for coastal management, shoreline management, things like hardening and seawalls and stuff are not a good answer for a lot of things because they're so bad for habitat, fish, etc. So what are some adaptation, I guess, most vulnerable places in our county, and then what are some adaptations that might be worthwhile? Yeah, so, um, you know, fundamentally, when we talk about options for sea level rise, it's the same set of options that we talk about for any coastal hazard. Um, it's protect, right, which is typically in association with, you know, engineered structures of one kind or another that have their pros and cons. Um, it's adapt, doing things like, you know, the most typical example is for buildings that can be raised, that can be flood proofed. It can be engineered so that they, if they do get flooded, the impacts are not severe. And you know this occurs in our county all the time, mostly through our building codes. Um, you know, if you drive to say three crabs, many buildings are elevated in association with following building codes, and that provides a degree of adaptability for flooding. Um, and then the third is uh, retreat. Right, you move stuff out of the risk zone, and all of them have costs and benefits. You know, um, none of them are easy, um, but one of the things that we try to do is kind of present information that can be used to weigh those costs and benefits, but oftentimes it's a very site-specific assessment that has to be done, at least currently, um, in Washington State. You know, in Clallam County, in terms of where is most vulnerable, like I'd love to be able to answer that rigorously, uh, because I really love the idea of trying to identify vulnerabilities that maybe we don't think of, because you know, what we've done for the Olympic Peninsula is just largely mapping. So when you do that mapping and you end up with these kind of big blobs, those are in the places that are low line. And so Dungeness always pops out as an obvious place that's vulnerable. It's low line. It's currently in the flood zone. There's every expectation that flooding there will increase in frequency and magnitude. Um, however, uh, you know, it's worth noting that we also, in, in that assessment, that we're working on, in which we're trying to map vulnerability, we include parcels on the tops of bluffs because uh, one of the mechanisms, one of the hypothesized responses of shorelines to sea level rises, increased erosion. And so on a bluff top, that can be especially impactful. And so uh, one of the things that if we can really rigorously look at these things, that I think we find is that we have much broader vulnerability and we think if we just look at a, a map where the dungeon is for Delta Pops, for example. Yeah. What do you think the spits are going to be? Will they grow naturally? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, you know, I think it depends on the rate of sea level rise. Um, and in fact, I think I had, I pulled this thing out that I was going to talk about, and then I abandoned it the last minute, but I thought it was kind of cool. It's horrible to look at, but. So this, what you're looking at here is a, um, a really cool study. This is a paper that was published in 2004 by two Canadians. Um, and what they did is they went all over the eastern strait of Juan de Fuca and they mapped the seafloor, so bathymetry, um, 
of the seafloor. They looked at, they used what's called chirp to look into the seafloor, to look for layers. And then they also collected samples in which they hoped to find organic material that they could date. And um, they used this to make what's called a sea level curve for the Strait of Juan de Fuca. This is associated with deglaciation. Um, so they were sort of interested in what was sea level like you know, from, say, 14,000 years ago to the present. Make that curve. And what they found was that sea level rise here, associated with deglaciation, was fastest between 2,000, or 2,000, between 10,000 and 6,000 years ago. So that's when, you know, globally glaciers were just dumping massive amounts of meltwater into the ocean. Sea level was rising very rapidly. The rate that they determined was an average of about 12 and a half millimeters per year. So why that's germane to that? So our current rate's probably in the sort of one to two range millimeters per year. The reason that that's important is because the other thing they have in here is they mapped uh, relic spits that were off of the Elwha. So those of you that fish, you kind of know these spits well. They're referred to as the humps, and they're a great place to catch fish. But they are relic spits that were drowned by sea level rise. And so kind of what that tells us is that there's certainly some rate at which those spits will just be flooded and drowned, right? And, but uh, presumably at lower rates, they might be battered a little more, you know, just as sea level rise creeps up and may migrate, may um, be broken. We, we don't totally know what to expect entirely. But if there's a real acceleration, I would expect they would just be drowned. Is there a smoke heat? <clears throat> healing now that the El yeah, now that the El dams are out. Oh man, loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> Is any such healing? Um, I so know, I don't know. I don't know if the property. Well, any such so is getting sediment supply from the El dams. Um, it's not getting a whole lot, and um, any such so has so many other alterations that have happened to it. It's hard to say exactly what healing means, I guess, in that context. But it is getting sediment from the, from the dam. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. I noticed that in last year's IPCC report, it actually said we're currently not on the 8.5, RCP 8.5 yeah. track, but a little bit below that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah which, you know, is interesting. I, I, don't, I don't sort of spend a ton of time looking at those emission scenarios, but I do think that tracking them as we move forward in time is useful. Um, my understanding is that we're still in this period of time when we can't really say, because they're so kind of like close together, if you will, um, that we haven't hit a point where we can sort of reliably sort of identify a divergence, but I could be wrong about that. So it'd be interesting to explore that a little more. I think it was more on the energy, yeah, actual emissions more than... Right. Yeah, modern, yeah. But I do think that's... As we move forward, that's a very useful thing to understand, especially because, you know, we tend to sort of, um, in, in planning processes, my experience has been the default is to select the high emission scenario because there's so much uncertainty about what to expect and it gives you sort of a degree of, um, um, you know, buffer, I guess. And, you know, the question would be whether we don't do that anymore. So, yeah. Is there an explanation why sea level rise is not uniform across the globe? Oh, thank you for asking that. Although it's a horrible answer. <laughs> <laughs> but I did bring it up. Um, because we do have a lower rate here than the global average. And I kind of alluded to that. Um, and just to illustrate sort of the question, um, I'm gonna, put, yeah, here's the map right here. Okay, so what you're looking at here is a global map of, this is that based on altimetry, right? So this is satellites actually measuring sea surface height um, over the last, since the early 90s. And I know at the bottom you can't see it, but there's a scale that goes from, oh, I think it's negative 15 up to 15, and this is in millimeters per year. So the current, and so the current global average sea level is four millimeters per year. So we're kind of in this yellow territory. So basically anything that is hotter colors than yellow are places where sea level is rising faster over that time period and places where it's cooler colors or kind of whitish 
is places where uh, sea level is rising more slowly. There's a whole bunch of reasons that this is happening, um, most of which are associated with one, we live on a spinning planet, right? We're not filling a bucket, we're filling a bucket that's being spun uh, at the same time. And the other is, I think, really fascinating to consider, and which is that you have these large masses of ice. So and I'm pointing to Antarctica here, which in this map view is like stretched all the way across the screen, which you know are massive volumes and massive masses of ice. <coughs> and as that material is lost into the ocean, the gravitational dynamics between that ice and the ocean changes. So there's a gravitational influence of that ice on the surrounding ocean. So one of the things that you frequently see, you can't really see it for Antarctica because the data aren't good from the altimetry, but if you look up at Greenland, where again, Greenland's losing mass, you frequently see blues and whites because even though there's a massive amount of volume of water being added to the ocean there, um, because of this gravitational response, sea level typically falls. And again, this is not what the land is doing. This is what the ocean is doing, right? So this is an ocean response. So that's another reason why, reason why there's regional variation. Um, where we live in Washington, it's not yet totally clear why we have a slightly lower rate than the global average. Um, my hypothesis is that we are actually experiencing uh, some of that gravitational benefit from melting glaciers in Alaska. So hypothesis, I haven't found anyone to pay me to figure that out yet. Mm -hmm. I'm working on that. <laughs> yep. So are you uh, postulating that the, uh, the mass effects on the plates, as opposed to centripetal effect of the uh, of the circulation of the rotation of the earth those two are working in opposite or not necessarily in opposite and it's not mass effects of the plates but of masses of ice right so uh, this what they call sea level fingerprinting um, is associated with uh, redistribution of mass from these big chunks of ice Antarctica Greenland glaciers around the globe. So, you know, when they lose mass, that's mass transferring from those bodies into the ocean. And so that changes the gravitational dynamics between, uh, between those bodies of ice and the ocean itself. So one of the consequences for us is that um, it's, you know, just to make this more horrible. <laughs> I think I have somewhere. This is a truly horrific slide deck. Just to complicate it further, does isostatic rebound from places being released from ice? Is that like long gone, that effect? No, it, it, it does, and it matters. It tends to be fairly small. And so uh, we, we see it here as an influence on land movement, but it looks like the tectonics play the larger role especially out here. Once you get into North Sound, that may change, but it's kind of hard to tell them apart sometimes. Um, so this is a um, sea level fingerprint model for Antarctica. And what this is intended to try to convey is that if you lose, uh, I think this is expressed in feet, so if you lose the equivalent amount of mass from Antarctica to raise global average sea level by one foot, this is actually how it would distribute around the globe. So the blue is actually sea level fall, right? As a consequence of that loss from Antarctica, sea level near Antarctica would fall, and then places that are distant from Antarctica, northern hemisphere, would see more than a foot as a consequence of that. So this is again why is there I think. Any way to make that intuitive? <laughs> I know. I just think about it for like five years. I don't know. Like uh, it's taken me a long time to wrap my brain around this. And I'm not. I'm not totally sure. Yeah. It, it, it helped maybe visualize it a little bit. You think you think about the tides and the the moon travels around the Earth, which is orbiting the Earth, 
And if you visualize the Earth as the obloid spheroid that it is, as the moon travels around, the water bulges out on either side and travels with it. And so the gravity of the moon is pulling the water off to one side. And in some places, it raises as much as 30 feet based on other effects. Around here, you know, seven or eight feet. But it, what he's saying is the Antarctic ice sheet is such a mass of water sitting on top of the land that it's actually drawing the ocean up against it a bit more than if the ice wasn't there. So as the ice melts, that attraction to the, the Antarctic ice sheet becomes less and less and less, and the water just flows away from it. So this would be a reversal of that attraction that you would see similar to the tides of the moon. Only that ice isn't orbiting the Earth, so that tide doesn't move around. It just stays in one spot. But it, and it's a lot closer to the water than the moon is. Yes, so and the attraction water. is yeah related to the distance. So, yeah. Does so cool help? process. I, I think of it more simply as the ice hugging the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> we have time for maybe just one or two more questions. Um, um, yeah. Yes. So what are your thoughts on the Thwaites Glacier? So Thwaites is an interesting one because it is it is currently the focus of a lot of interest. It's um, it's got a few things working against it. Probably the biggest one is that it has what's called a retrograde bed. So the glacier sits on a bed that's sloped into the continent. Um, and so the concern is, is that it can have sort of like a threshold based kind of runaway effect where if the, um, if the ice sheet at the end of the glacier, so in Antarctica, um, most if not all of the glaciers have an ice sheet in front of them. And that ice sheet serves to kind of buttress and pin and protect that glacier from other melt processes. Right now the worry is that if those ice sheets start to fail and go away, and that glacier starts to retreat on that downward sloping bed, that it could go quite rapidly. And the downside from our standpoint would be that it's a large glacier. I can't remember exactly the equivalent sea level 